Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Ambler's online worship service. My name is Ryan Balson. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad that you have joined us today. I want to tell you about a few of the things that are happening in the life of our church. First, I would like to invite you to get involved and connected with one of our small groups. Our small groups continue to meet through Zoom, so you can simply email me, and my email is on our website, and I would be glad to connect you with one of our small groups. We also have other ongoing ministries like our youth ministry and our children's ministry. You can connect to those through Facebook or also on our website. And especially I'd like to let you know about our Sunday school. Sometimes it's live, sometimes it's recorded, and this week we have a recorded Sunday school class. And if you did not receive the link for that, you can simply email Sarah or Kim. They're both available on our website, and you can email them and they'd be glad to send you to the link to our Sunday school for this week, May 17th. There are lots of other things happening in the life of our church, and you can find out what they are by going to our website, www.fpcambler.org. Now I would like to invite you to prepare your hearts and minds to worship God. God loved the world, God loves the world, and God loves you. May the truth of God's love for you shine through our worship today and renew our sense of calling. Come to discover, yet again, how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Come to listen for God's word to us, to offer our prayers, and to renew our calling. Let us worship God together.
most of us are familiar with Jesus' great command that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he also added a second part that's like it, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We realize that loving God and loving our neighbors is truly the great challenge of the Christian life because it's the great commandment. It's what we seek to do in Jesus' name so that we can be faithful witnesses to God's love for the world and also so that we can live in a way that is pleasing and honoring to God. What we all know though is that it can be quite difficult to love our neighbors as ourselves because it's difficult to love broken and sinful people. I suppose that's a shorthand way of saying it's difficult to love people in general because all of us are sinful and all of us are broken and all of us bring our baggage to relationships which can make, which can make it difficult sometimes to love people as God wants us to. So through the history of the church, we've sort of come up with a shorthand way to love broken people. It's a saying that's very common. It's been said for a long time. I personally have heard it many times, but this week especially, I, I've researched it, and one of the things I've discovered is it's not something that God says. This saying is this, that we are to hate the sin but love the sinner. This is not what God teaches. Instead, God teaches us something quite different, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, and it is ultimately God who convicts and God who judges. The question then is, what do we do when we encounter sin? To help us understand this, we're gonna look closely at a passage from John's Gospel, John chapter eight, verses one through 11. But before we read this scripture, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have given us your word and that you have commanded us to love one another as we love ourselves and as we love you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful in loving you and loving the people around us and that we would do it in such a way that people might see in our love for each other and our love for you the goodness of your gospel and your great love for us that does not fail. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In John chapter eight, it's a well-known passage. Jesus had been teaching in the temple and he went and he would stay overnight on the Mount of Olives and it begins like this. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him, so they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down began to draw on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone who is among you without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And at once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this passage, we have Jesus confronted with a woman who was caught in adultery. And we have Pharisees and scribes who brought that woman to Jesus, expecting to put him to the test, but also to make sure that she received the judgment and the punishment that she deserved. What we have is we have a test case of how Jesus confronts a sinful person and sinful people and responds to that with grace and mercy and love. Now one of the first things that we notice is that when the 
when the Pharisees and the scribes bring this woman to Jesus, they bring just her. Now, in the Old Testament, both in Leviticus and also in Deuteronomy, and where they speak about this exact situation, the scripture says that both the man and the woman are to be brought before the council. But in this case, it is only the woman. And the Pharisees and the scribes are right that the punishment is stoning. So they bring Jesus, wanting to put him to the test to see if he would be faithful to the law. What's fascinating is that when they come up to Jesus and they confront him with this situation and they put this woman in front of Jesus, his response, his first response, we're told, is to kneel down to begin writing in the dirt. There's been a great deal of speculation about what he was writing when he knelt down and wrote in the dirt. Was he writing down the, the sins of the accusers? Was he writing down the text of the law? Was he writing down something else? Simply, we are not told in the scripture. It doesn't tell us what he was writing. It seems to me that what happened was it was almost a, a theatrical move that Jesus knelt down and people were looking at him and by doing that, he caused the crowd's attention to move from the woman and to move instead to him. So the first thing he did when he was confronted with this situation is to move people's attention away from the woman who had been accused to Jesus himself. And then it tells us that Jesus straightened up after the Pharisees and the scribes continued to question Jesus. And then he said to them, he said, let he among you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Jesus' response was brilliant. It was brilliant because he didn't deny what the law taught, that the law did in teach, indeed teach that someone caught in adultery was to be stoned. But at the same time, he didn't give in to the basest impulses of those who wanted to cast judgment on her. Instead, what he did is he turned the focus from the person who was accused to the people who were making the accusation. This is so fitting with what Scripture says about how we are to deal with the sins of others. The Bible actually has a lot to say about sin. It talks about battling sin. It talks about God's hatred for sin. It talks about how we are to struggle with sin, how we are to repent from sin. What's interesting, though, is that when the scriptures talk about sin, it always talks about looking at our own sin rather than looking at and focusing on the sins of others. There are, of course, passages that speak of calling people to see their own sin and calling people to righteousness, but the scriptures never tell us to, to focus in on the sins of others. It seems that the scribes and Pharisees were making what in philosophy is known as a category mistake. A category mistake is where we ascribe to one thing something that is not proper to that thing. One way of thinking about that is, is to think about how we use similes and, and analogies. For example, when one says that the sea was angry, that's a category mistake. The sea, of course, can't be angry because the sea doesn't have emotions. Maybe in a more practical way, it's like asking an employee to answer a question that could only be answered by a manager or the president of the company. Jesus turns the lens onto the Pharisees and the scribes because he's telling them that they're making a category mistake, that they are not the ones who get to make the final judgment. They're not the ones who get to deal with the consequences of sin. What they've done is they've sort of stepped out of their place. After Jesus confronts these Pharisees and scribes, it tells us that just as he did the first time, he knelt down again and he began drawing on the ground. St. Augustine tells us that when he did this, it was a sign of Jesus' graciousness, not just to the woman, but also to her accusers. He said it was a sign of grace to them because by kneeling on the ground and drawing, he again called attention away from them to himself so that people could walk off and slip away without being noticed because all of the focus was on Jesus. 
Again, I think that's instructive for us, that when we think about sin and confronting sin, our focus is not to be on the one who's sinning, but instead our focus is to be on Jesus and how Jesus deals with sin and how Jesus deals with brokenness. After everyone had walked away, the passage tells us that Jesus straightened up and he looked at the woman and he spoke to her. And what he said to her was this. He said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go on your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Do you see what happened here? Jesus didn't deny that what she had done was wrong. Jesus didn't try to cover it up. Instead, Jesus confronted it directly, and he said, no one here condemns you, and neither do I. He doesn't minimize the reality of her sin. Instead, what he does is he moves the focus away from punishment to grace, from obligation to invitation. The invitation that Jesus offers her is to experience and to know newness of life, to go and sin no more. This is the great invitation of the gospel, that, we are, that when we who are sinful confront our own sinfulness and we bring it to the feet of Jesus, what he says to us is not a word of condemnation, but instead a word of invitation and a word of hope, that we can lay our sins at his feet that he can see exactly who we are and what we are, and we can know that we are loved by him and invited to a new way of life, walking away from that old way of life. I think that Jesus knew something about people and about human psychology. One of the truths that we know about life is that people are motivated less by fear than they are by invitation and by love. Fear is a poor motivator. People are only motivated for a short time by fear. When we're afraid of something, we might change for a while, but eventually that fear sort of wears off and we begin to return to our old ways. Look even at what's happening with the shutdown right now. At first, people responded out of fear. At first, people responded by staying home and you'd go out on the street and there'd be no one there. It was like a ghost town. But over the past few weeks, as people's fear has begun to dissipate, you find that it no longer motivates people to stay home and keep their distance. What is it that's motivating? What's motivating is an invitation to love and an invitation to make a difference. What's motivating with the shutdown is that we have the opportunity to protect people in our own communities by staying home. In this passage, what motivates the woman is not the fact that she avoided punishment, but instead that she's invited to a new way of life by Jesus, a way where she can turn away from sin and toward righteousness. It's the very shape of the gospel. Over and over again, our tradition tells us and the scriptures teach us that we are motivated to righteousness, not because we are required to do good deeds and righteous acts, but we are motivated to righteousness and we are motivated to do good deeds out of gratitude for the grace that God has given to us. So this brings me back to the thing that God didn't say that we're considering this morning. God didn't say, hate the sin and love the sinner. In this passage, what Jesus did was he loved sinners. You know, part of the problem with hating sin and loving sinners is that when we turn on that hate faucet, it's awfully hard to turn it off. It's very difficult for us to differentiate between the behavior that we hate in a person and the person themselves. That when we go down that road, it's easy to be overtaken. When we go down that road, it's easy to be like the Pharisees and the scribes who are more concerned about following the rules than the fate of the woman standing in front of them. 
when we hate sin, but say that we love sinners, too often it turns into some sort of moralism that demands that people live in the way that we think they ought to live, less concerned about their relationship with the Lord and more concerned that they follow our own rules and our own examples. What the scriptures teach, instead of hating the sin and love the sinner, what the scriptures teach us is that we are to love sinners and to point them to Jesus. That we are to love people and we are to be honest with ourselves about who we are and what we are. Broken, sinful people, reliant upon the grace of God, without which we are utterly hopeless, just like everybody else. The Bible does not tell us to hate sin and to love sinners. It's not our job to be the world's judges. It's our job to be people who share the love of Jesus Christ with the world. It's our task to follow the Lord's command that we invite people to know and to follow him. Last week, our Friday noon Bible study just finished up a study of James, and the book of James ends with this passage, which I've been thinking about all week long. In James 5, 19 and 20, it says this, My brothers and sisters, if any of you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It's not our job to be the final judges. It's not our job to continually point out what others are doing wrong. It is our task, it is our commission, it is our calling to love the world and to love our neighbors in Jesus' name so they might know and experience the magnificent grace of God, that our friends and neighbors might have lives that are transformed by God's mercy, and so that we might invite people to come and follow him. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you do not call us to hate sin and love sinners, but you call us to love sinful people in your name. And like Jesus, to invite people to a new way of life, following and loving you. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would help us to be faithful in this task. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Free at last, he has ransomed me his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me in my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. 
Last week, we started celebrating our high school seniors, and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to lift up two seniors every week. We hope that you will take this time to think about these students and say a prayer for them. Today, we're celebrating Adam Overton and Katherine Schoenberg. Friends, as we turn to the Lord in prayer, we're going to be lifting up our neighbors and our community as we begin to think about what it will look like for our church to open up and begin to have people coming back, not only to the church, but to other places in the community. I have to tell you, it's a difficult decision and the session has been praying and thinking about how to do that. And as we move forward and as we make some decisions, we'll let you know, but we're gonna be doing this online for at least the next several weeks but I want to let you know that we are certainly thinking about what's next. Also, I wanted to give you a quick update on Eric and Maddie Dorvier. Maddie's due date was Saturday, so it was yesterday. As of the taping of this, they have not yet had their baby, but it could happen any day. So by the time you see this, they could have had their baby, or maybe not. But the reason Eric hasn't been part of the recording this week is because they've been preparing for the baby to be born, and I, we thought that it would be easiest for him to not have to come and do some of the recording in case something happens. So we'll continue to be praying for Eric and Maddie as they await the birth of their child. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for your love and your faithfulness. God, that you are the one who sees us as we truly are. And you respond to us with an invitation to new and redeemed life. Lord, we pray that we would be people who truly examine ourselves and see ourselves for who we are. And we throw, your, throw ourselves at your mercy so that we might experience your grace and walk in newness of life. Lord, this morning we come to you with a world that is overturned by this disease, that is anxious and afraid 
but longing to reopen. God, we pray for wisdom for our leaders. Lord, we pray for courage for those who govern over us. Lord, we pray for researchers who are working on treatments and vaccines that you would grant them wisdom and courage and the ability to see ways to treat this disease. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with COVID-19. We ask, oh God, that you would bring healing and strength. Lord, we pray for those who mourn, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have friends and neighbors and loved ones who are separated because we cannot visit those who are sick. Father, especially we lift up people who are in nursing homes, those who work there, and also people who are residents there. God, we pray that you would watch over and protect life. Lord, we pray for people who are working on the front lines, for medical workers, for grocery store workers, for other people who have to go to work and do their jobs. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would protect them and watch over them as they are in harm's way. Lord, this morning, we especially pray for our local and county officials, asking that you would give them wisdom as they consider what it will mean for us to reopen in this time of COVID-19. Lord, we pray for wisdom for them. Lord, we also pray for our church's leaders, for our session. God, that you would grant wisdom as we think about our next steps, that you would help us to know the right time to open up so that, oh God, we might provide a safe place for people to gather and to worship at the right time. In the meantime, God, we pray that you would continue to bless our online ministry and our ways that we can connect together with each other. Lord, today especially we lift up those who mourn. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, those who are alone, and those who are suffering. Lord, we pray for Eric and Maddie. We ask, oh God, that you would grant them patience and that you would be preparing them to welcome a child into their family. God, we pray that you would watch over them and that you also would protect their health as they prepare to go to the hospital soon. Lord, we lift up all these requests and the requests in our hearts that we have not named aloud and all of it we lift to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord's command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. His command to us is to love one another, not to be each other's final judges. That's God's job. Our job is to love our neighbors and to point them in the way of Jesus Christ so they might know newness and fullness of life in him. So as you go out this week, let us go as people who point to Jesus over and over again, proclaiming his love for ourselves, his, our, his love for our neighbors, and his love for the world. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.